this podcast, we speak with Dr. Hemant Kanakia. He was the founder and CEO of Torrent Networking Technology, which got acquired by Ericsson, and co-founder of Taurus, acquired by Meriton, and Champless Inc., acquired by Tata Telesystems. He has also invested in over 20 companies in India since 2010 as an early-stage investor. He received his B.Tech degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, his MS degree from Case Western Reserve University, and his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford. At this stage of his life, he is now driven by a genuine desire to give back to India, a country which shaped his early years of education and gave him so much. So he founded the Maker Bhavan Foundation with a vision to modernize STEM higher education in India. He wants to fundamentally change the way engineering is taught in engineering colleges here and is driven by one key mantra in his life, we should give back to societies that nurtured us. Uh, my first question to you really is that, and I will sort of hit the bullseye with this, that this entire narrative about artificial intelligence, which really is the talk of the town, and someone like you who's fitting your time between India and the US, what is the difference that you see with this AI gold rush, which you have seen vis-a-vis -vis in the past cycles? There was a fintech gold rush, for instance. There was an e-commerce gold rush, for instance. What are the similarities between those past cycles? And what is making us think that the AI gold rush is here to stay? So uh, uh, if you know the history of artificial intelligence uh, research over the years, there used to be a phrase which says there is an uh, AI winter that comes along right after the sunny days. And that basically referred to the fact that every new type of uh, advance in AI generated a lot of different hype. Uh, some of it uh, bore it down, but eventually people realized its limitations and then the winter sets in. So the question that you might want to ask ourselves is, is this one of these hype periods which are eventually going to settle down to a winter where the people's uh, uh, investment focus and the uh, adaptation of the technology would move on to something newer and shinier. Uh, and there is always that uh, question at the mind of everybody. I personally believe that the, there are fundamentally some big changes that have occurred in this particular advance in the AI that this particular phase is likely to stick around for longer and it would have a wider impact on all kinds of businesses and uh, essentially you have people that go from extreme to the extreme some people think that ai is going to replace the human intelligence which i consider as a big hype uh, ai is not anytime soon going to generate vehicles that can autonomously drive the streets that is also a hype. At the same time, the AI has gotten mature enough to this stage currently and continues to mature very rapidly that is going to make a humans, uh, which are so-so in a particular skill, become much more productive. It's an AI assisting human that is going to be the case. So what that does to the jobs picture is interesting. You have a AI that is going to make a common programmer much more productive, which means there will be the need for a much smaller number of programmers. You can do the same thing for the back office uh, service jobs and things like that. So I think it will have a huge impact worldwide as well as on the Indian job market. Thanks for that, Iman. Uh, talking about the impact on the job market, and I wanted to understand from you, and the reason I began this conversation with someone like you on AI, because you are a serial technology entrepreneur. And very interestingly, you're splitting your time between India and the West, so you have an on-the-ground sense of what really is happening in the world of artificial intelligence. When you talk about the impact on India's job market, do you think it's about time to have something like a universal basic income? given to people in India 
just given the kind of jobs should be displaced by artificial intelligence i want to ask you this i i think that there is a need to reform our welfare system uh, our welfare system tries to identify the poor people or the people who lose the jobs and give them some kind of an assistance uh, that has not proved to be particularly good at identifying those people universal basic income sort of cuts that issue by saying i will help everybody the and in theory that sounds very good the problem is given the resources that the india has and can muster it it cannot be sufficient enough income to actually help people out except for a just rise to the poverty line and that is not the way to handle the ai boom or the loss of jobs i think we need to basically turn ai to our advantage by bringing it to making the our lives or how the government operates much more uh, much more efficient how each of us does a job much more efficient and we need to get into the building small businesses which take advantage of that so i am so so on the universal basic income is, is my take off so you are not a supporter of universal basic income as such i i consider myself more of a capitalist than a socialist <laughs> okay so uh, on that note i also want to ask you that you said that shrija as an economy and as a proud indian you would also want to use ai to your advantage right so if you were suppose having a chat with the government of this country what the five things you would tell them as part of the new dispensation which is right now that they can deal with this new tsunami of technology and really turn this into an advantage for a country with a demographic dividend like ours i i i think the thing to keep in mind is uh, uh, there are two trains of thoughts among the economists that are advising india to do development one of them says that just make india service sector much more prominent that's what the raghuram rajan and his kind of people say and the other is focusing on the manufacturing i i think what we need is to use an ai to make manufacturing feasible uh, for a small to medium scale industries that is what is going to create a lot of jobs as opposed to people who are doing programming and uh, back office kind of a work which is mostly an urban phenomena so what you really need is using ai in agriculture using ai in automation of the factories at a small scale not a large scale and things like that which would create lot many more jobs and india's basic uh, need at the moment is to create the jobs in the uh, most in the rural and the secondary towns not in the big micro areas payment i also want to understand more from you about the maker foundation something that you used to so closely involved in right now but before we get into the mechanics of the foundation i want to understand about you and your journey as an entrepreneur uh, having founded three tech companies what really has the experience been and how are the 90s different from the 2000s i i i think uh, i sort of uh, travel through a range of activities in my life i started out a being a good engineer i got a bachelor's in iit bombay i got a phd in stanford university both are premier universities of uh, the, of those countries and then i went to work for a research organization in us so from that i actually became an entrepreneur and developed some uh, critical technologies that have been very helpful in the spread of internet so so i I've, i've seen a range of activities i've done in my life at this stage in my life i am a lot more focused on giving back to india because in some ways i think that my journey has been uh, boosted or propelled forward much more by what the education i received in india and the people i went to 
school with uh, in our IITs. And, and so it has been my desire with this Nekatron Foundation to give back to India. In particular, what I'm looking at doing and what we have been doing with Nekatron Foundation is to modernize the pedagogy of how we teach the engineering education in our engineering colleges. In particular, ours at the time when I went to the school here was a lot more theory-oriented work. Uh, still that tradition continues. We are trying to make it much more experiential. We are trying to make students uh, learn how to innovate and have soft skills. That's our overarching vision of where we want to work. On. So Hemant, when you say that you are trying to make it more experiential, can you give me more specifics of it? Does this mean using technology, using AI? What exactly are you looking at? So I give you a personal example that shows a difference between the kind of education one gets in India versus one gets in the US. Uh, I, I learned computer science programming in India. Uh, I learned the rudimentary aspects of what we call a compiler, which is one of the software piece. It was all theory about how to write that kind of a software. I went to Stanford as a graduate course. The first thing I learned was not just the theory of writing that piece of software, but actually building a working prototype. And that is what actually gave me an confidence that I can go out and build a real system. This is the difference between the kind of education I got in IIT versus the kind of education I got in Stanford. And so the fundamentally what Makerbone Foundation does is uh, makes learning by doing as a philosophy in every program we support. We give donations to various uh, colleges. We work with the faculty members to develop courses, which actually are a project, building project kind of orientation and similar kind of programs. So, Heman, if you were to work with IIT Bombay, to devise a course, what would your involvement be? Or would you be teaching at the institute? Would you be designing the course? What exactly would you be doing? So IIT Bombay, we built a uh, facilities where any student from any discipline can come together with an idea and actually build a working prototype. It's called an academic maker space. Which, which is where the name for MakerBorn comes from. A makerspace is where anybody with an idea can come in and build things, either individually or as a team. That's where we started seven years ago. It has had an impact in the sense that now all of the entering batch is asked to go through a course where they actually do nothing but build a small working prototype that tells students how to work in a team, how to actually make engineering trade-offs, how to explain your idea to the people. Uh, similarly, working with the electrical engineering department faculty members, we have transformed about 12 of their existing courses to actually have a project orientation. So they actually, along with teaching theory, provide a theory. So our role at the Mikarbon Foundation is a is of a catalyst. We don't go and teach ourselves. We give them the funding and we influence the existing faculty members to actually change the way they are teaching. Uh, that, that is what we do. But do you think that capital is enough? Do you think that just by providing capital, the change is happening? Or do you need something more fundamental to drive the kind of impact that you are looking at? I think that given the academic institutions uh, have a, a lot of freedom, of how to teach, there is an academic freedom issue. The imposing uh, any kind of a uh, any kind of a direction from the top generally fails. It needs to be a grassroots effort, and it's not the capital that is interesting, but the capital is given for following a particular idea. So it's like an it's like a. Uh, Seed capitalists, you know, when you give a seed money to a startup, it's never sufficient by itself. But if it is seen attractive enough, then other people jump in and start doing the things. Uh, and and that that actually has worked out well. I mean, um, right now, Maker Bond Foundation has created this kind of facility and the changes in courses 
at uh, 11 top tier colleges. Out of them, the five IITs and six private colleges like Bix Pilani and Nirma and others. Uh, and we are also expanding this year to another 20 tier two colleges doing the similar kind of a thing. Uh, and this has caught on. I mean, uh, most societies now have accepted that this kind of a courses are necessary and they are developing it themselves. We don't have to give them any money to do that. So you basically want to bring about a fundamental change in the way engineering is taught in this country. You think that is very, very theory oriented. You want to make it not only very practical, but you want to nudge students to actually build prototypes of what they are learning. Uh, I recall my conversation with Ashish Nuan, who is now the architect behind Ashoka University. He was a very prominent private equity investor, Cypress Capital in India, hung up his boots at the age of 40 and then started the Ashoka University. And I asked him the question that, Ashish, why didn't you take the impact investing route? and by a non-for-profit, by a foundation. And he said that, Srija, the reason for that was we wanted to do advocacy. We want to work with the government to bring about a change in how education is there in this country. I think what you are looking at, Hemant, is a, is a very large canvas change. Don't you think that it would be important for you to work with the government or quasi-government institutes to bring about a fundamental change here? And is that the reason you are designed as a foundation we, we have already actually influenced the government policies in a way that we have not actually publicized uh, very much uh, for instance seven years ago when we started at iit bombay we called our maker space as a tinkering lab uh, the first use of that name and i described what we were doing to the additional secretary in the education ministry who was in charge of technical institution. And he loved the idea so much that he did two things. Uh, one is to basically mandate that all IITs do such a thing because he was part of an IIT council. And the second thing he'd say that I'm going to take this to actually a large number of high school students. And that is the genesis of Atal Tinkering Labs that you hear about a lot. So in a way, we have influence the what is going on at the government level again my view of how you influence a government is by doing a pilot with a small number of colleges existing colleges and this is where i kind of differ with the philosophy that ashish dhawan has done he has created an excellent new institute called a ashoka and he has been able to have a different kind of a pedagogy and a different reputation in the arts and humanities kind of colleges. A similar thing has been done for a management colleges by a different group of people in ISB. Uh, my philosophy is that they are very good ideas and very good role models, but they don't affect that many people. By the time we are actually able to say, do and whatever we are doing with a hundred colleges across the country, we would have affected the lives of 10% of the engineering graduates that are coming out every year. That's a very different level of impact. And that does not require any assistance from government. Our government means well, they move very slowly. <laughs> I like this expression, <laughs> government means well, but moves very slowly. Uh, if I were to ask you the three points of frustration that you have from the Indian education system, which propelled you and nudged you to bring about the seismic change. And because uh, from what I gather from this conversation that your heart lies in tech and science, you're an engineering enthusiast, your entire world revolves around that. What would be those three areas of frustration? I, I would say uh, the three things that we are trying to close the gap with are related to the frustrations I see. One is that uh, we do not uh, have the students learn how to work in teams to build an actual uh, system. Learning to work in a team implies you learn how to respect each other's opinion, how to make the trade-offs in a way that pushes the project forward. It's a skill set that one needs to learn. This, 
and and that it comes and and the trade off you have to make in building any system because you're working with the constraints of resources and the time uh, that is one thing we don't learn when all you do is mug up and tax and write for exams that is a very individual effort it doesn't relate to a real world the second part that i don't think we teach our students well is how to be inventive you know we think that oh there are some people who are born inventors and they can do new things but that is not the case everybody can learn to be creative and do well there is a skill set that we need to actually impart to a large number of students and the third thing that we need is that they need to learn how to communicate you know a lot of these engineering students are in general our students don't actually get a training on how to communicate in public how to actually put up their ideas persuasively and those are the things that we hope to accomplish by whatever programs we do thanks for that himant himant how do you think that organizations like ours which are about uh, communication so public speak it's really about fostering and bringing the ecosystem together which we are the ecosystem builders where community builders can help you in this initiative of yours how do you think that we can also possibly collaborate and bring about the seismic impact that you are looking at i i think that is something really worth uh, thinking through on our part because although i have learned the hard way how to communicate uh, by being in the us and uh, pitching for my ideas to get the money uh, i think there are a lot a uh, people like you and your organization can actually build uh, perhaps we could have a intercollegiate competition which talks about uh, anything related to public speaking you know there are things either a competition or a workshop is something that we could all work together to wall and because of the reach that we now have we can basically get people to sign up for those things um, bear certain costs if required to do so and take advantage of whatever Uh, skill side you guys have uh, i don't know if that appeals to you it it definitely, definitely does uh, yeah. thanks for that even then we should definitely have a conversation uh, sort of uh, offline maybe more on that uh, but i also sort of wanted to understand more from you himant that what really is the construct of the program uh, you you give money to the institute is it a report card how do you assess the impact and suppose those prototypes have been built by the students then what happens next are they open to vcs for funding are they open for institutional capital so what how does the machinery really work so uh, it, it give you some statistics i think uh, across all the tech, uh, all the maker spaces we have built we see something like uh, 3000 student unique visits uh, every month into one of these facilities or last year alone the students have built 2000 plus projects uh, six seven startups have come out of it and multiple different international competition projects have been built out of that and this is a sort of a very crude measure of the impact we are having already uh the there are other ways like the invention factory which is our workshop to uh, teach students how to invent in the past 3 years they have filed about 74 patents uh, so in in a sense we are keeping track of this kind of an impact uh, we are also so our process is we give the people money we influence the changes in courses and we require in return the faculty members and the universities to provide a quarterly progress report Uh, and we have dedicated staff actually to actually go ahead and monitor uh, we also uh, in future as we expand to colleges we'll have a third party evaluators visiting them and measuring the impact we have and that's in the process we are working with third parties to do that that's that's how we go at it i would just end up by saying that giving money and throwing money and walking away is never very effective uh, it's not effective in us it's not effective in india 
I can see monitor. the sense. Yeah, I can see the sense of involvement, and the very fact that you have a very systematic approach that you also assessing, examining, and valuing as to what the progress really has been, and perhaps also take corrective steps if the need be. How happy you are with the progress? If I were to ask you, Hemant, that's a very sort of heartfelt conversation here. We having a very meaningful conversation. What the things you would have liked to be better, and what are the learnings that you have had till now? We have gotten a lot of experience of working with the top tier colleges, and we know how that would actually work. We have influenced other top tier colleges, so that is something that we absorb as a knowledge base. We are trying to apply that to second tier colleges. These are, say, colleges or to the Eduki or Daurashda uh, University or something. The names that we don't normally hear. But a bulk of our engineering graduates come out of this kind of colleges. Uh, IITs and NITs is 0.5% of our engineering workforce. So those places are run somewhat differently than central universities. And we have a learning to do and to how to work with them. One critical difference is in the IITs, the faculty members have a lot more freedom and a lot more say on how to shape things. In the second year colleges, is more top driven. So we need to have a buy in from the director or, or the vice chancellor of that institute before we can make progress. So that's the learning that we are currently going through. Thanks for that, Iman. These are very meaningful inputs. Uh, I also want to understand from you about given you are in the education space. And we have a very interesting video coming from Sal Khan, who is basically runs the Khan Academy where he's basically using the current, the current iteration of AI to basically teach maths and science to his kids. I want to understand from you that what is the role of AI that you see in maths and science and teaching students? What is the role of AI that you see there? I mean, how progressive will it be? And can AI really, really replace the conventional mode of teaching that we have? Um I have actually invested in some ad tech companies in US. I've actually been keeping track of the new advances that are actually going on in use of AI into variety of parts of the education. Uh, I personally think that that approach will be meaningful maybe a, another five to 10 years from now. Right now, taking AI and saying we are going to have an uh, individualized instructions, which is what the AI proponents talk about, it is yet to be proven. I'm not quite sure as to how effective the Khan Academy that is driven by an AI, which is an individualized uh, instruction, is in terms of currently teaching it. I think it's a good direction. I'm just not sure it is mature enough at this stage to okay. be applied to a large number. You know, I wouldn't roll it out to a one crore students in India. And why would that be? Because the philosophy is that AI removes the constraints of time and space. You're basically learning everywhere. It's very you know, important. A lot, yeah. A lot of our students go to the education to get a thappa so that they can get a better job. Uh, they can get a better chance in the marriage the marketplace, right? I'm not quite sure what an AI-driven Khan Academy is going to actually do to that particular motivation fulfillment. And in that sense, if the students don't have a motivation to take it seriously, how much education it actually imparts. So I, that's, that's the reason for my skepticism. <laughs> that's very well put, Hevan. I think these insights that are coming from you are very real and very sort of on the ground and coming from somebody who has really observed the Indian market very closely. Uh, what really are your conversations with, say, the ministry or the government on the education space? Where do you think are the hesitations? Where do you think the improvements can happen? As somebody who's a true believer and is such a true fan of the Indian ecosystem, and you're building, you're putting your personal capital. I think you have earned the right and the wherewithal to have a commentary on this. So what really do you think are the spaces where we definitely need improvement? I, I, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I would take an objection to your saying I earned the right. I mean, there are a lot many more people who have done a lot 
more in the Indian education system. And Ashish is the one is a prime example of that. Uh, I am actually working with Ashish Dhawan on a different foundation creation that would solely focus on the policy-related stuff with the government. And in that arena, what I think, and I think Ashish also believes that, is that we need to actually figure out how to rank each of the universities properly uh, and also reward them properly if they are doing well. You know, right now we have a National Institute ranking, NIRF, which is a hodgepodge of a lot of different things. And it's not very helpful, although it is being paid to attention to by a lot of universities. So again, I think there are things that can be done at a policy level that we should. I mean, that's a separate effort that I believe I will spend part of my time in the coming years. Thanks for that, Hemant. Hemant, as, a, as an angel investor, in your capacity of angel investing, uh, what have you seen the similarities between Indian startups and the US or differences? Uh, this entire comparison which we had that what comes to the US comes to India 10 years later, comes to India after five years from China, what are the trends that you're observing in the market? And this entire narrative which is being played out, the golden era for Indian startups, how much of that is fad? How much of that is truth? What really is the sense that you get? I think uh, Indian ecosystem is very vibrant in terms of actually doing the startups. Uh, in 2000, I mean, 2010, when I started putting some money as an angel investor, things were looking very dead. Uh, since that point in time, uh, a, a lot has happened. Uh, in the last four or five years, most of the startups are actually Me Too kind of startups. What worked in US, uh, we take in a model and tweak it here and there and, and throw it to the Indian masses, which is not a bad thing to do as long as, I mean, as far as your interest is in actually making money, uh, but it is not a earth shattering thing. That is not how you are going to build a Alibaba or Baidu kind of a company, which is actually giving a rough competition to Google's and others. We have yet to enter that kind of a stage where we are inventive enough to come up with the products and the startups, both in the deep tech as well as in the digital area that would stand against the world's best. And I think that's the next stage that is coming. I, I have no doubt that given the Indian uh, entrepreneurs and a deep bench of uh, talent we have, we will get there. In terms of the angel investors, I think it's a very broad-based movement. Not many more people who have no clue whatsoever what a startup is are still willing to put money into it. Yeah, you know, it's like saying, sure, I can I can put them in 10 lakhs. What's the problem? I mean, uh, I would, so that sort of a thing should give way to people who are genuinely aware of how the startups work and are able to help them. Uh, again, that is yet to happen. Kimmel, you are somebody who understands technology so well. You are an entrepreneur turned investor began this conversation talking to you about artificial intelligence. I also have to ask you about, say, the crypto economy, the blockchain economy. What do you think about some of these new areas? And uh, how should a country like ours deal with it? Blockchain fundamentally as a technology has established its use cases, but crypto is proving to have some bad actors. As someone who is a seasoned investor, do you think we are there yet in adoption of crypto? Or do you think it's still time? I think uh, crypto, uh, people make a lot of different claims about a blockchain. Let's talk about the blockchain stuff. Blockchains could be found useful. The problem for the blockchain technology currently is that it consumes a lot of computing resources and to what extent that can be useful uh, in lowering the transaction costs overall is not very clear to me. So that is a big stumbling block for them. That is not 
a reason not to work on it, but unless you remove that, it won't be a widespread technology. Uh, crypto by itself is a application of blockchain, and that's that's like a uh, that's like a gambling in a stock market. That that's a satta bazaar, and I'm not quite sure that. I mean, whether you say yes or no, people are going to do it anyway. Uh, but it's not something that I would pay much attention to as a saga. Okay. I mean, <laughs> okay, I have two questions for you. And now we're getting towards the fun part of the conversation. Quick answers from you. And it's like a bit of a rapid fire. If you were to name me the most overhyped technology, what would that be? Oh, you said that. Blockchain. <laughs> okay. The most underrated technology? I think the uh, gene... Uh, the gene... Uh, Gene editing based healthcare. That is the most underrated, the gene editing yes. based. Yeah. Okay. One advice to policymakers in this country, especially about tech, what would that really be? Focus on creating jobs in the rural areas or the second tier market. Focus on uh, not on the large uh, chip factories, but on supporting people who make pencils, who make the kitchen utensils much more productively out of Rajkot. Okay. Where will the next trillionaire come from? We have seen companies like Facebook being built. We have seen companies like Google being built. Which sector will give us the first trillionaire? I thought you were going to ask me which tech entrepreneur is going to be a next trillionaire. And <laughs> an answer to that is it depends on how long Mr. Mukesh Ambani lives. <laughs> Okay, so you are, you are putting your money on Mukesh Ambani, the next trillionaire, is it? He, he is definitely the best candidate that India has currently. Okay, what is your view on someone like Sam Altman? Uh, Sam Altman is a great marketeer. Uh, he is very plugged into the ecosystem uh, in the Bay Area. And he has managed to ride the next uh, wave. He was part of why Combinator now is part of OpenAI. I mean, he himself is not in technologies by himself. He is going to have a great influence uh, on the world by being on top of OpenAI. Okay. And uh, give me one innate philosophy that you live by in your life. You have to give back to the society that nurtured you. That's my main mantra at this stage in life. Okay. And my last question to you, Heman. Entrepreneurship is very difficult. It's really like eating glass and staring into the abyss. This is how at least Musk described it. I want to understand from you, there are times and situations in the life of an entrepreneur or somebody who's working at a job. And the reason I ask you this is that you have such an incredible and lustrous past of building companies and selling them. What should one do? How should one talk to oneself when nothing around is working? How to believe in yourself when nobody is believing in you? Well, uh, I, I think that is something that cannot be actually uh, taught to the person. I think it is a very much of an innate desire uh, of succeeding. I mean, when I was actually an entrepreneur, I, as others describe me saying, there is no way I'm going to fail. Before I fail, I will die. Uh, you cannot impart that kind of an attitude in people. Uh, what I would say to the struggling entrepreneurs is that you do not have the highs in life unless you suffer some lows. If, if somebody just gave you 10 billion as a lottery, that's not going to make you happy. But if you came from a stage where you had a hard time meeting the employee payrolls and then you made a $10 billion, that is going to be a very different kind of a success. So I would say that, wait, I mean, life always turns. Just carry on. Thank you for that, Heyman. Thank you for your time and energy to this beautiful conversation that we had today. I look forward to having many more. Thank you so much. And I enjoyed having uh, this chat with you, Sri, Sri Jha, and hope we continue to have a conversation in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.